It started with a foot drop. I said to my father, what's going on with your foot? He and my mother had driven down to San Diego from Carlsbad to have dinner with me. This was when he was about 79. She was a few years younger. I had noticed as we were walking into the restaurant that his right foot was dragging along the ground, kind of scraping as he swung his leg forward. It's been kind of dropping, he said. No big deal. I got to check up in a couple of weeks. Turns out it was a big deal. He was diagnosed with the degenerative nerve disease. Slow moving, but still. The scary part was that it had the possibility of developing into ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Over the next year, my father's foot drop became more pronounced. He had some problems with fine motor skills, but generally all was well. He was well. And then he wasn't. The disease had developed into ALS. ALS is a super degenerative nerve disease. Um, people lose all control of their muscles. Uh, Stephen Hawking was an outlier. Um, he lived a long time, but most people only live a few years. They gradually lose control of all of their muscles, um, although their minds remain unaffected. Uh, as their bodies waste away, they're sharp as ever. And that means that they know exactly what is happening to them. Within a few months of the diagnosis, my father was no longer able to hold a book and could barely manage newspapers. He wore only sweatshirts, sweatpants, and slippers because buttons, zippers, and shoelaces were in the past. Um, he hated being seen with a walker and would leave the house only to go with my mother to the grocery store because he could use the shopping carts as a walker and stroll around like everybody else and to go for rides in the car. The rides relaxed him and they were becoming more and more frequent because he'd started having panic attacks. I mean, how could he not? Every day he was watching himself die a little more. It wasn't long before he couldn't manage trips to the grocery store. My mother was his sole caretaker and she didn't like leaving him by, him by himself. So to give her a break, I started driving to Carlsbad more and more often. One day, not long after she'd left for the grocery store, my father's hand started shaking. He put it up to his face and said, I don't feel so good. Panic attack. I said, let's go for a ride. I managed to get him out the side door to the driveway. I helped him to my car, where he insisted on making his own way around to the passenger side, leaning on the car, stepping sideways, kind of moving hand over hand. He fell into the seat. I buckled the seatbelt, and we were off. We drove around for about 20 minutes. Mostly we talked politics. My father was a lifelong Democrat, and he loved the old saying, I'd vote for a yellow dog before I'd vote for a Republican. He especially liked saying it after he and my mom got a yellow dog. By the time we got home, he'd calmed down. He worked his way around the car, then held onto my arm for the short trip to the house. I opened the door. There was a small step. As he was moving up the step, he collapsed straight back into my arms. Now, he was down to about 130 pounds by then. But that was 130 pounds I wasn't expecting. It, it kind of staggered me. Um, I set him down right there where he was on the tile just inside the door. Immediately, he said, help me up. I could tell he found his situation humiliating. I said, just a sec, and I reached around him for his walker, and set it in front of him, and walked around behind him, got him under both arms and said, ready? He said, just pick me up. So I did. Got him almost all the way upright. He had grabbed onto the handles of the walker and was struggling to get to a full standing position when he collapsed again. This time I was ready. I caught him. I sort of carried, dragged him to a chair just a few feet away and sat him down. He slumped over sideways. I sat him up straight. I looked at him. Dad? Nothing. His eyes were open and blank. I took his pulse. Nothing. 
There are a lot of stories in which someone discovers that something terrible has happened or they're badly shocked. And the character says, I don't know how long I stood there. It could have been a minute, it could have been an hour. But I know almost exactly how long I stood there because I was doing some intense mental calculations and I figure it took about 15 or 20 seconds. Here was my thought process. He's had either a massive heart attack or a devastating stroke. If he somehow survives this, the last few months of his life will be spent in a painful, miserable, confused non-recovery as the ALS finishes him off. If I call 911 right now, the paramedics might get here in time to revive him. I walked into the kitchen to get a glass of water, walked back, and set the glass on a small table next to him. I needed it to be there. I waited. A minute passed. Two. Three. I was numb, catatonic almost, four minutes. And then, not wanting my mother to arrive before the ambulance, I called 911. When I heard sirens, I went out to meet the EMTs. As the ambulance pulled up, a car was right behind it, my mother. I directed the EMTs into the house, then headed her off before she reached the front door. She said, all the way up the hill, I kept hoping the ambulance would turn, and it never did. An EMT blocked our view into the room where they were working on him, but I stole a glimpse. CPR is not how it's depicted on TV. It's an alarmingly violent procedure. And damned if those EMTs didn't get his heart started. I said to myself, no, no, no. It had been at least 10 minutes. After they left with my father, my mother and I robotically repositioned the table and chairs that had been pushed aside to clear space for them to work on him. I thought he was okay at first, I lied. I even brought him a glass of water. My brother drove down from L.A. that night. My sister flew in from the East Coast the next morning. Our mother sent us to Tri-City Hospital to make decisions. She said she couldn't do it. When we got there, the doctors told us there was essentially no brain activity. Regaining consciousness would be impossible. And if they were somehow wrong about that, the short rest of his life would be, as I had imagined, horrific. Shaken as we were, we decided on the spot. Take him off life support. Now, we were led to a small room. Soft lighting, soft chairs, soft sofa, Lots of beige. We sat there for a few minutes in silence. I couldn't stand it. I found his room just as the nurse was about to remove the breathing tube. For the second time in two days, I was told, you don't want to see this. And this time I didn't. As I sat with my father, I said nothing to him because I knew he wasn't there. Or if he somehow was there, he wouldn't appreciate it. He'd consider it melodrama. Emotional, bl emotional blather. Instead, I mentally traced the path of his life as I watched him. Born in Southern Indiana, where his mother died in 1918 of the pandemic when he was three. Prestigious Swarthmore College. Staff Sergeant in the US Army Air Corps in World War II, where he spent all of that war on an air base in Brazil, sending and receiving Morse code. Returning home to uh, the family retail business, women's clothing. This is the opening of um, one of their stores in Northern Kentucky in August 1950, exactly 70 years ago. He and my mom moved to uh, Southern California, start their own business. Uh, they eventually had four stores in North San Diego County and Southern Orange County. Here's an ad from the Escondido store, 1980. And finally, after 40 years of working six days a week, retirement, in which he surprised all of us by being perfectly happy, doing absolutely nothing. And now, finally, right here, this hospital, this room. 
His internal systems and organs, which had been pumping and firing away for 81 years, took about half an hour to shut down. I went to tell my brother and sister. Then we went home to mom. My mother is 98 now, doing pretty well living in a retirement home in Carlsbad. She has only one complaint about her situation. She says, almost everybody here is a Republican. For political companionship, she watches Rachel Maddow. I've never told her about what I did the afternoon of my father's collapse. How, on the fly, with no authority, I made that decision. And she never will know. I've made that decision too. There's so much we don't know or don't understand or think we know, but we don't. That little piece of hurtful knowledge will not be a part of her. There's a great line that comes from I don't know where, but for me it explains everything. It goes something like, life is just the occasional spark that gets thrown off when matter rubs against itself for long enough. Shakespeare's Hamlet referred to life as a brief candle. I thought about that as I watched my father's weakening candle flicker, then die. For a while, however briefly, it radiated heat and light. And that should be enough.